Welcome to another episode of Seaweed Spotlight. This week, we are coming to you with the United States Coast Guard and Lieutenant Bruce. And we had a good talk with him at Seaweed. Yep. Very informative. Very educational. Learned a lot. I think you will, too. Yeah, it's going to blow your mind some of the stuff that they do that we didn't realize they did. No idea. And also, if you like red fishing, you better listen to this. Episode. Pay attention. <laughs> if you do anything yeah. offshore, pay attention. Yeah, if you're I more than three no miles idea. offshore, you need to pay attention. I had no idea some of the either. things that were applicable. So, yep. good stuff. Enjoy. Have fun. And we're back with uh, Lieutenant Bruce for the United States Coast Guard. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. But first, we were gifted this bottle, Frigate Reserve Rum, 21 year, which if you follow along, you know this is one of our favorites. But Graham, thanks Graham. We're going to sip on this while we talk. Uh, Lieutenant Bruce is not going to partake due to being in uniform, which is very admirable and respectful. When I was in uniform, I also would not drink in uniform, so. But yeah. So. Lieutenant Bruce. Thanks well, for joining us. Yeah, welcome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And the, the rum smells great. It's, it really does. Yeah. Give it a good smell. It's got a nice nose to it. It's Isn't correct. That the That's the right. word. That's right. That's the word. That's the word. <laughs> so you guys are running a booth here this weekend as well? We are. So um, I obviously I'm with the U.S. Coast Guard, like you talked about. But specifically what I do, um, I'm with the Southeast Regional Fisheries Training Center. And what that means is the Coast Guard's a multi-mission agency, and so we do everything from ice breaking, federal aids to navigation, which is fancy talk for buoys, uh, you know, maritime commerce coming in, and mm -hmm. also maritime law enforcement. One of the missions out of our 11 missions is what we call living marine resources. So that's a, 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 a detailed way of saying fisheries and fishing. Okay. okay. So what my unit does is we do the accreditation for federal law enforcement officers in the Coast Guard to do fisheries boardings or fisheries law enforcement. Interesting. Interesting. It's a mouthful. So yeah. is this so is this like um, when you say fisheries, are, we, are you talking about law enforcement for like big fishing vessels like or just anybody? Well, the answer is yes. Okay. So it's both. <laughs> and so from my perspective, when we talk about fishing, there's generally two different kinds. There's the kind of fishing you're going to do where you can eat it, you take it home. Mm -hmm. And then there's commercial fishing. So someone's going, you know, going, going to make a profit. That's their business. And so you have commercial and then recreational fishing, both of which are regulated industries. Yeah. Or I guess the recreational fishing isn't really an industry industry, but it's a, a regulated sector. Right. So you've got to have a certain size or only, you know, you have to use certain gear yeah. and so on and so forth. So you're the commander for the site here? I was Correct. I'm yeah, the okay. commanding officer okay. for the Southeast Regional Fisheries Training Center, awesome. which is a Coast Guard unit. And how long are you guys at the downtown location? We are. So we are responsible and I'm responsible for the Atlantic seaboard and also into the Caribbean. Oh, oh wow. So it's a whole lot of... of That's huge. It's pretty big. <laughs> well, and I think the biggest thing, like if I could have everybody take away one thing, it's that when you're more than three nautical miles offshore you're in federal waters and what that means is is that like the state regulations south carolina georgia florida etc those state fishing regulations might not apply in the same way and right. you're actually subject to federal jurisdiction i wow. see so a really good example in South Carolina is like our red drum fish down here. Yep. Sure. Everybody loves red slot drum. Slot fishing, yep. Super good. It comes in a slot size, um, you know, a minimum size and a maximum size. And there's a reason for that, which we can talk about later. But once you're in federal waters, it is not legal and there are regulations against taking and harvesting or keeping red drum. Wow. So none more, at all? None at all. So how do you, so how do you, <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that. Right. And I fish out here all the time. Exactly. For redfish. <laughs> yeah, Never so, offshore. So how do you, so how do you handle a situation where maybe someone gets stopped or boarded that's been way offshore, but now yep. they're inshore and they're in possession of stuff that's illegal? Is it illegal because they've come into a place where it's not, or, or where it is? So to, to answer your question precisely, the answer has to be, it depends. Okay. Right? Because, so as a law enforcement officer, what would you do? We'd have to say, where was this red drum taken? Yeah. You know, if someone says, yeah, I was 10 miles offshore and I, I took this red drum, look at it, and I'm posed with it, and I sure. posted it on Instagram, and yada, yada, yada. That's pretty easy, right? Because we know the location, or at least the person's made an omission of the location, right. and so on and so forth, and, it, and you, you can't keep it whatsoever. Sure. 
Um, but in any other cases, it's really going to be the totality, the circumstances, the evidence, what people are talking about, and also what's going on. Okay. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, very interesting. Do you guys do like the uh, you know, like picture store the location of where the photo was taken? Do you guys go that deep into it to look at pictures and see if they were inside that that line? So, yes. Yeah, I figured. You, you absolutely can. Um, where the U.S. Coast Guard comes in with respect to fisheries, and so that's when you're going to take. So think about it this way: since we got a minute, it's more of a long form thing. You can sure. think about it like yeah, this. Yeah, please do. So y- y'all are whiskey and whitetails, right? In order to hunt whitetails in, let's say, the state of South Carolina, what do you have to have? A license. A license. You got a license. Yeah. And yeah. why do you have to have a license? Because uh, they require it, but uh, they also we we don't mind buying a license because it, it actually goes into paying for the management of deer in, but with, in the state. Uh, also, with the license, you're issued tags, you're and, issued you, tag. and you have to. It's it helps manage the the, the take okay. for, for the whole the whole the whole state. You're, you're supposed it. to right exactly. So, whose deer? are the deer roaming around <laughs> on the edges. I never thought of it that way. Whose yeah. deer are those? Yeah. They're the states. Yeah, they're the states. Yeah. And by the states, by virtue, what we what is meant by that idea is that they're the peoples, right? right. Yeah. And the way that you you have barrier barriers isn't the right word, but the way that you regulate entry or harvest of whitetails is by a license and a tag. Right. Which is exactly one of the reasons why you have to tag a deer in order to move it yes. because it changes basically, and I'm doing air quotes here for your audience, that's where it changes like the ownership right. yeah. that becomes yours. I get it. So if we think about fish in the ocean in the same type of manner, mm-hmm. um, all of those things start coming into play. So your fishing licenses, the size that you're harvesting, the gear that you're using, what it's doing is it's regulated by regulations and law based on science, depending on where you are. Yeah. I never really thought about that way that it's that it's the state's deer, and then because you have a tag, it then becomes your deer. Right. right. But that makes sense in a law enforcement aspect. Exactly. So when you're asking me from a law enforcement aspect, let's say, do you look at the photos and where was it? What we're required to do is take a look at, okay, was the fish harvested in the right way? Was the means that it was taken done in the way that's, you know, uh, applicable to, was it in line with the regulations and stuff? And we partner with, so U.S. Coast Guard is under the Department of Homeland Security. We partner with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Mm -hmm. Atmospheric Administration Mm -hmm. under the Department of Commerce. And NOAA has an office of two offices that come into play here, National Marine Fisheries Service, and then also the Office of Law Enforcement. So you have NIMPS, NM, or November Mike, Foxtrot Sierra, right, National Marine Fisheries Service, and then you've got Office of Law Enforcement, OLE. So NIMPS helps set the regulations for federal fishing. And the way that regulations get set for federal federal fishing is, like, absolutely fascinating, like, if, if you're into that kind yeah, of stuff, yeah. Yeah. because it's a, it's a really it's a really interesting piece of regulation and I guess like regulatory creation. So what happens is this, and I will circle all the way back around to the Coast Guard. So okay. bear with me. On this. No, we're with you. Yes, it's good. So it's the people's fish. Mm-hmm. Think about it that way. And if you think about okay, we've got these barriers to entry, or excuse me, you've got these like uh, means to entry mm-hmm. by way of licensing. Yep. Okay. And I'm speaking in absolute generality. So there's exceptions, there's nuance, there's context. Everything has to be right. added in. So what happens is, is that in the federal waters, fish are required under law. They get looked at by stock size. And basically what happens is, is the best available science gets used in order to assess the stock size. How many fish are there? What, how many babies do they have? Where do they live? So on and so forth. And that science has to fill, or what it has to do is substantiate the folks at a fisheries management council. And these fisheries management councils are regional all across the United States. So you've got a North Atlantic, a Mid-Atlantic, a South Atlantic, a Gulf, a West Coast, Hawaii, or Western Pacific, and also Alaska. And the reason they're regional is that the needs, the economics, the industry, the species, the environment is different depending on where you are in the greater U.S., right? And these regional fisheries management councils are made up of scientists, 
government folks who are staff workers and work for the councils, but they're also made up of stakeholders. So boat owners, yeah. uh, fish house owners, okay. and also folks who represent like the recreational sector. Okay. And what the councils do is they come together to make recommendations for regulations based on the science that then go to NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service at NOAA, who then either gives it the final okie doke or, or no, you need to change it. Yeah, yeah. And those regulations that are actually from the ground up from both regulators, agencies, and scientists and stakeholders yeah. become the regulations, which then translates to your gear, your sizes, your seasons, wow. and so forth. I didn't realize there was that much to it. Yeah, there's a lot of, so, when you say scientists, is that scientists at both organizations? For example, the reason I ask is you're, you're talking about uh, decisions on limits and sizes uh, being different depending on where you're at in the country. Yes, NOAA, and species. Right, NOAA, NOAA covers the ocean and the ocean floor with their satellites, right? That's what they focus on? Well, NOAA is a, is an, I couldn't speak too much for NOAA, so okay. I want to be careful here because, um, but... The office at NOAA that deals specifically with like fisheries regulations yeah. would be National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay. okay. But I, I think if we're using shorthand, NOAA is probably the easiest way that we sure. can. I gotcha. Okay. Um, I thought you were talking to them as separate organizations, so that's that's my bad. My main thing on NOAA was uh, the they're like the the broadcasting. They still broadcast all day on VHF radio. Right. And you can anywhere you're at you can pick up NOAA. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is pretty fascinating to think about because a lot yeah. of people don't even really use it. VHF anymore, yeah. but, but they still maintain that space. I think they do it on VHF, UHF, HF. Oh, they? I think that, that would make sense. It, if I'm not mistaken, they'll still broadcast weather across uh, across all those. That's fascinating. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. So, you have any cool stories from uh, like you, you run the SARS, the search and rescue side as well? I personally don't run the search and rescue side. I've been stationed like some of my stations. I've been in. 20 almost 20 years now so i just oh, wow. i just punched 19 years uh past this past january oh. um so you're ready to get out then i, I uh <laughs> it was an accident to be honest with you <laughs> that's, that's um, what i've heard yeah i i joined up after 9 11. um i was in my early 20s my, my mid to early 20s and i thought i was going to do four years get the gi bill call it good check my civic duty uh and then go to college and and uh that was almost 20 years ago wow that's <laughs> what i did I joined at 23, and I, but I only did, I went to Afghanistan, and then uh, I, I came home and got out. That was right. it. I just did my four years. I used the GI Bill, though. Right. I didn't join for that. I never intended on going to college, but I ended up doing it. Neither did I. It's free. I, it, if I were, so when I joined the Coast Guard, I was a high school dropout. I'd actually never passed freshman year of college. Wow. I, I had an eighth grade education on the books, um, and I had failed. I had actually gotten a GED. Um, and it was just, you know, so much of life is luck and timing, right? Yeah. Oh, and for sure. So did you come in enlisted? I was enlisted for 10 years. Okay. Um, so I, my, my first actual maritime law enforcement operations were fishing boats. Uh, and they were actually international fishing boats. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was stationed on what was called the, it, she's no longer with the Coast Guard anymore, but it was a Coast Guard cutter Jarvis. Cutters are cool. She was 378 feet. Um, I showed up all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to, you know, ready to learn and see what I could do. We got underway uh, within the first couple weeks that I was on board. And the skipper that I was with, um, the way the story goes, we're, we're in international waters. And one of the ways that some international fish are caught are what's called drift nets. And if you can picture like a volleyball net, right? It's got a volleyball net, but you got like floats on the top yep. and then like weights on the bottom, yeah. right? Well, so what we were, what we were, the operation that we were doing at that time um, is we were looking for high seas drift net fishing vessels. And we came across this vessel in international waters and it wound up having so I'll tell the story this way. So we radio this vessel, and I'm looking over the edge. And we're, in the, we're like, must be hundreds and hundreds of miles offshore. And they're pulling this drip, they're pulling this net up along the side using mechanical advantage to pull it up. Yeah. And every single shark that they would pull up, they'd cut the fins off, they'd grab the shark, and they'd throw the shark no, back, off, back into the water. Jeez. And I was like, rip roaring. I was like, I couldn't even believe it. And, I'm, and so we tell them, we radio 
through a bunch of other offices and stuff. So we radio the boat, we get permission to engage with this vessel. And so we tell them, hey, heave to and prepare to be boarded. And it takes this particular fishing vessel three days to pull their net on board. And it was wow. 25 something miles long. It was like 20 something miles what? long. What? Yeah, right? It was e- it was enormous. So I had never it seen it. It took that long? It took, it took it forever. Me- day and night mechanically wow. pulling it. And so wild. it was gigantic. Um, so anyway, so I get on, I remember, so I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, I've just never seen anything like this before. I'm a guy from St. Louis, Missouri, right? So I wind up talking to my chief and my boss as I get the creden- like the, the qualifications to try and get on board and, and, and help out the boarding team. And I remember, I'll never forget this. So we go, on, we go from my big boat, we're gonna go board on, on this fishing boat, yeah. and we get on the small boat to go ferry in between the two, right? And I get on board, and the crewmen on board this boat are wearing like cotton pants and no shirt, no shoes. Wow. And there's a bucket on the side that's where they're going to the bathroom. Jeez. I'm in a dry suit yeah. with like, you know, fleece and hypothermia protection and this, that, and it is cold out. And I remember, I mean, quite honestly, like almost kind of having my heartbreak. I mean, it was like, so, mm-hmm. it was it was heartbreaking to watch like, here's this fisherman on a boat just trying to make a living by doing what they're doing. Yeah, They're just trying to do what they do. So we go through the boardings and that was actually my very first like law, like Coast Guard mission and operation as like a young buck wow. on the boarding team in international waters. What a way to cut your teeth, man. That's right. <laughs> It was, I mean, it was pretty neat. And so, so we go there and we wound up throughout that course. So I was, you know, it was a three month long deployment when we were out at sea and we wound up, uh, you know, doing cases and getting on board. I think if my memory serves me, I think it was like five other of these boats and we escorted them back to their host country who then came and picked those boats up and, and took them back to that country. And we were supposed to go to Alaska. That's where we were supposed to port. Okay. So you're out in the Pacific. Yeah, we're out in the yeah. Pacific. And all of a sudden, after we had done these escorts on these boats, we're running out. You know, we have to go refuel. And I remember, I'll never forget, the skipper goes over the 1MC. You know, the captain gets over the announcement system. And he goes, well, we were supposed to go to Alaska, but we're closer to Japan. So I hope you like Mount Fuji. Let's go. Wow. <laughs> and so the first port call, you know, here I am, like, getting on board these boats, middle of the wow. ocean. Very first port call was, uh, was uh, oh, I think it was Yokohama, Japan. Um, Japan's it, beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so yeah. great. It's so clean. Yeah, my chief goes, all right, bud, see you on Monday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. like, That's it? Yeah. That's what I do? Like, yeah. This is my job? And then, then, all right. and you're like, and now I'll stay for 20 years. Yeah, yeah on accident. That's fun. That's crazy, man. What a wild, I don't know. What a I wild never considered story. like how long boats can stay out or vessels to stay out um, like a long time. Well, she was with that I mean, much fuel. Jarvis, she was 378 feet. Yeah, and it could how many? How far it could go back and forth, or you would have to fuel. It, could you go to Japan and come back without fueling? I don't remember. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating that you That's could cool. make that trip with one tank. That music seems extremely loud. Yeah, they turned it up, and it's really loud. I don't know where it's coming from, but I would <laughs> give me a second. I'm gonna go tell them turn it down. Um, yeah. While he's doing that, what what do you see with the work that you're doing as the biggest issue or threat that we that we're seeing here on um, maybe the Atlantic or the South Carolina coast with regards to fish or fisheries? And, is there one thing in particular that stands out or that's uh, that's been an issue recently? Well, so one of the things that's been introduced recently would probably be descending devices. Okay. So a descending device, um, this isn't like a threat, but it's a new regulation. Okay. So let's take a, a real big fish out here would be like red snapper. Right. Right? Yep. So red snapper is part of what's called the snapper grouper complex. It's okay. managed under snapper grouper. Okay. And any of your snappers, queen snappers, lanes, you know, red snapper, yep. or your yep. groupers, right, right, that you're going to catch, they're bottom dwelling fish. And when you're offshore and right. you pull up one of those snapper groupers, yeah. a lot of times what you see is barrow trauma, right? Yeah, yeah, their yeah. eyes the bug eyes out, big, the swim bladder's coming out of their mouth, right? right? Right. And so one of the ways that the 
the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council has worked with stakeholders um, and what NOAA has done is they've introduced new regulation and it's a gear requirement called a descending device. Okay. And the requirement for this piece of gear is that it has to, at right. a minimum, if a person is fishing, either recreationally or commercially, oh. and they're in federal waters. All right, so condition one, you're in federal waters, three miles offshore or more. Right. Number two, you're fishing for a snapper grouper. If that's the case, even if it's commercial or recreational, you have to have in your possession a descending device. So even for, for vermilion, not just red snapper, but vermilions as well? Should be the case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I can double check y'all on that one, but I'm, I'm pretty I would make sense that it would be sure. are a snapper. So. If they're managed yeah. under the snapper grouper. Now what that does is when a fish comes up from the bottom, it suffers barotrauma, yep. right? It just, it, the change of pressure is pretty, pretty big. Right. Well, we do, we're pretty sure we, so the science is pretty sure to suggest that the quicker that you can get that, that fish back down to depth, yeah. the, the absolute higher likelihood that fish will survive. Okay. So the people that pop the bladders, that's killing them, right? Not necessarily. There's a method for venting fish that is uh, effective. Okay. Um, it, but it has to be done right. But so a descending device, what the gear requirement is, yeah. is at a minimum, the whole, the, the, the principle of a descending device is to get a fish down to depth. Mm -hmm. The minimum requirements is a 16 ounce weight. Okay. And at least 60, 60 feet of line. Huh. So that can be a, so there's, there's stuff you could buy like yeah. at your tackle shop right. or there's stuff you could, you could build. Sure. Um, so Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, Georgia and a couple other state agencies, but also uh, South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. They've got a lot of resources online where you can like watch YouTube videos on how to build your own descending device. Right. You know, it'll, yeah. cost you, it'll cost you gum and, you know, gum and, gum and twine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, how do you connect it to it? I'm just trying to figure out. So the, the, the best way I could probably describe it is, is if you buy something commercial, let me, let me talk about a DIY version, yeah. right? That, that would meet the spirit of the law or the regulation, excuse me. You could, one could. So here's the requirements. 16 ounces of weight, 60 feet of line, and, and, and uh, readily available. Meaning that it's gotta be you can there. use it, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Not it can't be like wrapped up in cellophane underneath, like yeah. you know, all sorts of stuff and stuffed below. Like that dog won't hunt. Ain't gonna right. work, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean to me. So imagine, let's pretend this is a DIY. You could take a milk crate, you could flip milk it over, crate. you could line that. We flipped it over so the opening is on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. You could line that lip with weights and then tie a 60 to 65 foot line to the center of that. Uh, top part of the milk crate yep. so that you know maybe tie that line off to a cleat would probably be the smart thing to yeah, do yeah, yeah. you, you, you know. don't lose your <laughs> exactly so you don't lose it no yeah that would be I, I do have one sir I just I, I, it's I sunk it. it's right. sunk and, and then I would say it. thank you very much but you do not have one <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I was using it in the spirit of the law I'm going to use that term you said spirit of the law I'm yeah. using that for something I don't know what <laughs> yeah so you could take a snapper grouper yeah. that you brought up and you could put it in the water right you could put that inverted upside down milk mm. crate on it with the weights and you could drop that fish right down back to depth I see. and what would happen is that barrow trauma you know that that basically that fish would get uh, i don't know what it would be called they like d explode d barrow trauma yeah that's a good question i don't know the answer to that but anyway you can get you can guess the drift it's it's yeah. now back at depth right. and has pressure and okay. so as long as that happens quickly the species or the fish is, is likely going to survive. Interesting. And the reason for that is that the science supported uh, that the species mortality, right, the fancy way of saying not dying, would be able to get them down there, which would e end up requiring like rebuilding the fish stock so that yeah. there's more fish in the future for people to catch and eat. Right. You know what's crazy about the snapper thing is it's uh, it's like it's like a weekend a year that you can catch red snapper. I believe it's four days. Yeah, four days. Yeah. But what's fun, and it's because they're so endangered. If if we go out offshore here, we go out and we catch vermilion. There's going to be red sure. snapper there. We pull up red snapper constantly. Sure. I mean, they're ever. It's like 
It's the, it's the I've caught more red snapper than I've caught redfish. Right. It's so, but but they're like a protected. You yeah. Know, it's that's such a it's a weird one to me. That's one of the conversations that I have with fishermen all the time. Like not fishermen, guys that fish. Right. I had that conversation all the time. Like they, they don't seem like they're that hard to catch. Well, and I I, I couldn't speak to um, you know their stock size. I mean, basic. The only thing I really could speak to with any type of authority is like the season yeah. and the requirements for keeping it. Right? Yeah. So, um, but we do hear that, that, that type of stuff. Um, and what's interesting is that the management councils are required by law to implement or at least recommend regulation that will rebuild the fish stocks, right? Like they're yeah. required by law. Sure. Yeah. And so every move and every regulation that's being introduced and ultimately adopted by NOAA is specifically has to say yes this will rebuild the fish stocks so we're going to have more fish gotcha interesting so what are you guys doing with your booth here so here it's honestly just the kind of stuff we're talking about right now it's outreach education and if nothing we want people to know that hey the u.s coast guard partners with noaa that if you're more than three nautical miles offshore, you're in federal waters. So please be aware, and People it behooves to you that. to be. A, it behooves <laughs> you. Oops. I would, I would have. I would not. I would not have known that there are potential law, law changes once you get past. And they are federal. Yeah. Well, they're they're regulation changes. Regulation changes. Totally. Right. Yeah. I, I did not know that that uh, it was three miles. So it is three uh, nautical miles. I have yeah. a hankering for trying to be very precise so that I don't miscommunicate. Yeah, yeah. That's fair, and that's that comes with leadership because it, it only takes you miscommunicating once or twice to be very careful about what you say going right. forward. Um, the laws change for fish and things state by state, right? Yes, they can. So as you go up and down the, does that, do they change also for you for you guys when you get past three, or is it pretty much the same up and down the East Coast? It's pretty much the, okay. it's pretty much the same up and down the East Coast in federal waters. Okay. Um, but there are areas like I like. Remember when I was saying the regional fisheries management councils? Once you're in a different kind of region, mm-hmm. it'll change based on the species okay. and the different region. But those are much much larger yeah. when we compare those to the state regulations. Right. Because I was it always well like when we we've done some duck hunting and fishing up in like Pamlico Sound and things further up that are closer to North Carolina. And you go out and you're you're bouncing around between that that line that is north of South Carolina like how do you keep track of what has a real thing change and like it's, it's you get yourself in a lot of trouble yeah. if you're not careful for sure it definitely does yeah. that's really fascinating I did not know it was three miles but it's funny because the southern flyway for jets like the protection I think is three miles it might be and I think I believe that has to do with different air spaces but what, what we're talking about is what kind of who has authority, right? Mm-hmm. Like whose right. regulations apply? Because you can't fly airplanes more than past that. Really? Like if you fly out of here, you cannot just go. Huh. You're not allowed to pass that line. And I believe that line's three miles. So I guess the, the it's federal waters. It must also be federal air, I guess, above the water. I couldn't speak to it. I do yeah. boats. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I, just, I just think it's funny that it, that's, that's like the thing. Like, yeah, everybody thinks that you could just... If you wanted to, you could just leave, and hmm. I guess you can't. <laughs> you probably could. Just yeah, maybe could. some yeah, ramifications yeah, yeah. if you do. Do you guys do a lot of boardings? We do it. Well, we, yeah, the U.S. Coast Guard does all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we do boardings wearing a couple different hats. Some of that's going to be safety. Some of it, it, you know, if you have the means to fish or are fishing, then there's going to be a fisheries uh, aspect to that boarding. Um, if there's a search and rescue case, we do boardings there too. Um, usually after the fact, but but generally what we're talking about is maritime law enforcement for sure, and that's going to be that the applicable laws and regulations, you know, given you know, given the various authorities, and, Who, and we're the primary uh, at sea agency for right, maritime yeah, law that. enforcement. Yep. Yeah, and I, I see you guys out of because I used to I sold the boat, but I had a boat and we would launch out here and come through the Ashley, and I'd always see y'all riding up and down. You got a fifty cal on the bow of the boat. That's the case. That's a cool boat. <laughs> I, it's like a uh, not a not a. Um, I don't know what they're called. Not a. It's not a uh, zodiac, mm-hmm. but it's, it has that rubber front on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely do. Well, and again, so they're those are multi-mission vessels, right? So the Coast Guard is a multi-mission agency. So when I started this whole thing out, and we're talking, hey, the Coast Guard really is responsible for the buoys that are in federal waters, right? That are moving, you know, multi millions and billions of dollars worth yeah. of maritime commerce, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Uh, ice breaking. I mean, it's winter time. Doesn't feel like it right now, but in a lot of the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, being able to move those federal waterways and keep those open for commerce and, and such too, um, drug interdiction with a maritime nexus. 
um, you know, living marine resources, marine environmental protection. So we wear all these hats, especially, and the reason for that is we're a, a, an agency with history. And what that means is that the U.S. Coast Guard really came from when the United States fought the Revolutionary War. Right, yeah. There's, they Basically, the founding fathers, the short version is said, hey, we're going to have to pay some taxes. Yeah, we're yeah. going to have to figure out a way. We've, we've spent a lot of money doing this. So they introduced uh, the Cutter Revenue Service. And it was a series of boats called cutters yeah. that would collect taxes and tariffs no kidding. on goods moving in and out. Okay. Now, at the same time, you had a lot of people moving to like coasts and things like that. And yeah. you fast forward in history, and you had the United States Life Saving Service. Interesting. So if you think about like North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Cape Hatteras, all these kind of areas in this vicinity where y'all are, have a really rich history of life saving that at a long time was that role was filled by the U.S. Life Saving Service. Okay. Now, at one point, the U.S. Life Saving Service and the Cutter Revenue Service basically came together to form what is known as the modern day Coast Guard. Hmm. And so that's where we get this, that's the basic story of where we get this multi-mission capability. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, we, you know, we wound up, uh, up, not absorbing, but incorporating, like, the steamship inspections. Because back at the time when, like, steam was used to mm -hmm. move boats up and down, like yeah. a fledgling nation, well, if you didn't have, like, standardization in, like, the boilers, yeah. you got, like, boilers exploding. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which would suck. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, yeah, yeah. I would imagine so. <laughs> yeah. um, and and then like the lighthouse service, right? Yeah, right like yeah. Lighthouses. So that's that, one of the most fascinating things. I love the, I read something about the lighthouse service um, that the Coast Guard does. I can't remember what it was now. But I did not know that you guys are responsible. I knew the buoys, which, right. you know, a lot of people don't know who owns the buoys. Right. But, but it's like, yeah, the lighthouse part, I, I, right. that would be, if I were to go back and join the Coast Guard again, or <laughs> I was in the Army, but if I were to go join the Coast Guard, I'd be like, can you put me on lifeguard duty? Right. Or right. lighthouse duty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like polish the light. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah and there's some beautiful ones. And, they, and, they, and all of them, I, I don't know if I should say all of them, but a lot of them have a very rich history both yeah. in their locality uh, and the communities and stuff. So, yeah. so we, as the U.S. Coast Guard, really fill this interesting role of being both a, a federal agency, an enforcement agency, a life-saving agency. Right. Um, and also like very much historically and embedded in the communities that we're in, which is interesting. So Yeah. That is interesting. For sure. And fish. And, and fish. fish. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you want to promote uh, while you're here and then? No, just happy to be here. Um, happy to be of service. Glad we could, you know, talk about this stuff. I, I mean, Seaweed's pretty neat. It's a great uh, yeah. venue for us to be able to have these types of conversations, uh, to answer questions, to be able to say things like, hey, if you're three miles offshore, you're yeah. in federal waters, yeah. you know, please learn the regulations. It, it'll, it'll do you well. Sure. Um, and then I know uh, there's going to be a search and rescue demonstration on Saturday, February 19th at 1300. Cool. 1 p.m. for you non-military folks. <laughs> um, so we're, there's going to be a oh, operations for many. There's going to be a Coast Guard helicopter, Coast Guard boat that are going to come in and they're going to do some uh, training exercises and right off the river. Here. Oh, oh, here on the Ashley. Oh, right here on the Ashley. Oh, okay. I thought you guys were going to do it in the harbor. Oh, awesome. perfect. So we'll be able to see it. Yeah, right here? Cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Awesome. Yeah, sweet. Well, well, cool, man. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, a lot of our listeners hunt, but, you know, in the off season they fish or yep. even during season they fish. Um, this is good stuff for everybody. I, I enjoy it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, Lieutenant Bruce, thank you again for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Sir. All right, guys. All right. Thanks. See you all next time.